Welcome again. We are still continuing with time varying channels. Now we we'll touch on Rayleigh, Ricean, and Nakagami channel models for time varying channels. Um, among the topics and the objectives that we listed, specifically in this video, we'll focus on identifying Rayleigh, Ricean, and Nakagami fading. And we're also going to touch on the issue of difference between delay spread, coherence time, doubler spread, and coherence bandwidth narrow band, wide band communication, and slow fading and fast fading. So let's take it on. Time varying channel impulse response. The transmitted signal, the signal to be transmitted is U of T, and then taking the real part of, of the signal of the message multiplied by exponential is like multiplying by cosine. So S of T is the modulated signal. That's the transmitted signal. For the line of sight received signal, we're going to get the same signal, but delayed by tau. The amplitude is going to be scaled by alpha t. So we're not getting the same amplitude. And for the phase, we're going to have uh, an extra phase, which depends on the delay. Not only that, since the channel is time varying, we expect to have a doubler effect. So the frequency will not be the carrier frequency, but rather the frequency of the carrier shifted by the amount of doubler. For the practical signal, a noise will be added. So this noise term will be added to the signal model. The doubler, the path loss and shadowing impact which scale the amplitude. And of course we have the dominant delay here. Delay increases with distance. It's shown here and it's shown there. We're going to have many baths, this is just for the line of sight. We're going to have many baths with different angles. So instead of having one term here, we'll have the summation. The summation goes from one up to capital N. What's capital N? It's the number of uh, baths, multiple, number of, <coughs> number of multi-bath components. And uh, we add, we're adding noise to that. If you take the carrier here term as uh, a common factor so we can have the, a baseband equivalent model here so this is called the baseband model which is uh, the unmodulated term how did we get this this is the result of u, at, u of t convolved with the channel response so this is the baseband model for the channel while that's the passband model so we have the baseband model for the channel so this is a result of convolving u of t with um, with the channel itself. By comparison, I can extract what u of t is. So time varying convolution. Okay, so I'll get this term. Okay, instead of u of t, we'll have delta. Because when you convolve u with this, you get this expression here. So the last term here is the most important term, which is the channel impulse response for a multibath channel with different paths and different delays, amplitudes, and phase shift. I would, I would suggest that you remember this. The time varying impulse response, the effect of multibath, uh, we have physics here, the channel physics, and we have here the effect of time variations. So on the left-hand side, we'll focus on the effect of multibath, and here we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the effect of the time variation. The first thing I would like you to notice here is that what we call the delay spread. It's the time between the first arrival and the last reflection, which is also which is also the inverse of the coherence bandwidth. Let's see the examples here. I'm giving this example here. We have a channel at time t0, a different time, third time. So we have four different responses. What's the delay spread? It's from the first arrival to the last arrival. This time is called delay spread. So we have more spread here. We have even more spread here. We have less spread here. So the delay spread is the time between the first arrival, if you like, the first arrival here, and the last reflection or the last arrival. So here we have, of course, more spread, which means the energy is going to spread over time. This is inversely related to the, band, to the coherence bandwidth. The delay spread is inversely related to, to the coherence bandwidth. If you channel have a, an infinite bandwidth, then you get exactly one pulse. There is no spread. Now, uh, 
alternatively if you fix the time delay here and we just study the change with, with time then we can talk about coherence time coherence you can think of coherence as similarity so if coherence time is large it means the channel does not change if the coherence time is small it means the channel would change frequently so it's the time during which channel is fixed and that's inverse of the doubler spread let's just focus on the time for now we have delay spread okay which is a measure of how many multipath components as opposed to the, to the impact of time variations which is the coherence time now communication over a channel okay, engineers need to choose the bandwidth the bandwidth for the signal which is of course inversely related to the pulse duration or the bit duration so now if your single symbol duration is greater than the delay spread yes or no if the answer is yes then it means that we have bandwidth narrow band okay communication if the answer is no then we have wide band communication okay why because the spread and the bandwidth are related so uh, if the time is greater than the delay spread if you take the inverse it means that the signal bandwidth is less than the coherence bandwidth in that case we have what we call wide band communication so everything is measured between the signal and the channel so if the sig if the signal is less than the coherence bandwidth we say we have narrow band communication which means it's not a big problem alternatively we have wide band communication which is also known as, as frequency selective or dispersive all right now we'll see this also in the diagram on, on the time domain on the on the frequency domain now if you look at the time if it's less than the coherence time okay we are here if it's less than the coherence time it means we have slow fading because you are sending the symbol the channel does not change alternatively we have what we call fast fading so we have four different possibilities we can have narrow band slow so we have narrow band or wide band we can have slow or fast of course a single communication could be wide band and fast or wide band and slow so uh, we have one feature from here and one feature from there again we can represent the time and in the frequency in an inverse relation our focus in the beginning will be on the symbol single we'll, we'll focus on narrow band and slow and fast both slow and fast fading so we'll focus on narrow band communication let's see this in a more detailed fashion narrow band communication means that the symbol itself takes okay compared with the channel is narrow band so we can treat the channel as being flat here because it's simple however if you have this kind of bandwidth while this is a channel response then you see different part of the channel is being treated differently I would like you also to remember that the delay spread and the coherence time are related so if you have 100 meg 100 microsecond delay spread we have more spread we have less coherence bandwidth and of course any communication here will tend to be uh, wide band all right so let's consider some <coughs> extreme cases static channels so this two 3d diagram shows you the response of the channel at different time instances with red then you have yellow and then we have blue this is the tau or the delay axis let's say that this gray line represents the symbol duration or symbol time you can see here that we have static channel why static channel because changing time does not change the response they all look the same and we may call this wide band because relative to the pulse duration relative to the symbol the the response extend over few symbols so this is uh, this is a result of being uh, wide band communication so it's slow fading in fact it's the it's the extreme case of being slow because it's static it does not change with uh, it's extremely slow if you like if it's static 
uh, we will start with our current focus. We'll, we'll not talk about wide band channels. We'll consider that, let's say that uh, the received signal is at a certain given tau. So it does not extend over time. But it's time varying because the response is changing with time. So at this instant of time, you have an amplitude. Another this instant, you have different amplitude. But they, all of them, they arrive at the same time. And which means that uh, we have kind of no spread and we have narrow band communication. Later, once we consider the narrow band, we can consider the extreme general case where the response at different instances of time is totally different. So it's different in T, different in tau, and that's the most general case. The channel <coughs> could be narrow band or wide band. Let me share with you how things would look like in terms of the number of resolvable paths. Let's say that we have different arrivals, 0, 1, 2, 3, I'm showing here three examples. The paths are resolvable if the difference in the time of arrival is much greater than the channel bandwidth. Now, if otherwise, if this is not true, then all of them would seem to arrive at the same time because we don't have that high resolution. So all of the arrivals, multipath, will just become one spread of one pulse. So there will be some time spread. And the response, the impulse response will look like this. Note that this response is also a function of time. So I'm just fixing the time and I'm looking at assuming, of course, that the channel is static. We call the high, the maximum, dis, the maximum time between the arrival and the latest arrival, the delay spread. So TM, the delay spread, is equal to the maximum difference between paths arrival. So TN, maximum, the maximum, the latest arrival compared with the first arrival. Of course, Delay spread causes intersymbol interference because it's like echo. So if you say one and then there are echo, you have to wait until the echo is over. Otherwise, we'll have some intersymbol interference. And for the same physical channel, we could have uh, different communication speed. So we have to respect uh, we have to respect the delay spread which also changes with, with time. So here we have, a, the picture shows here the narrow band scenario, and in the wide band scenario, we have lots of uh, resolution that we have. Remember that what matters is how much bandwidth we dedicate. So this is the same physical channel. If we have more bandwidth, then we can see the details. If not, we call it narrow band communication. That's for the same physical channel, but how much bandwidth we, we utilize. Now let's do the following practice. Given a channel with delay spread of 10 microseconds, <clears throat> two systems with board rates, 10 mega, 10 mega board, and the other one is still, it is 10 kilo board. So 10 mega and 10 K, 10 mega symbols and 10 mega, and then 10 K symbols. What is the propagation distance between the first and the last paths? Okay, that's straightforward determine the amount of intersymbol interference. You can stop now, pause, and try to answer. Once you are done, you can continue with, with the presentation. For the first one, we know that, now that the time for the solution. So if, if you want to try, you can pause the video. Now the time uh, the required for uh, between the first and the last pass is 10 microseconds. How, how do you convert this into distance? By multiplying by speed. So 10 microsecond is equivalent to um, three kilometers. Now for the 10 megabots case system, we have 0.1 microsecond. So the, the pulse, the symbol duration, one over 10 mega equal to 0.1 microsecond. So this intersymbol interference would, would last for at least 100 symbols. Why? because 0.1 divided by 10 microsecond, or, or 10 microsecond divided by 0.1, you get 100 symbols. Now for the case of 10 boards, the symbol rate is, the symbol slots or duration is 100 microseconds. So the ISI would be very small if you divide, okay, so if you, if you divide now 10, divide by 100 microseconds, so we'll have much less 
inter symbol interference if any the narrow band fading model in this slide we're going to construct the narrow band for fading model so we'll start by the received signal from all paths at the same time so we have the received signal equal to the real part of the exponential carrier this will give you a cosine and what we are going to see is the unit is the transmitted signal and there's going to be a delay there's going to be a phase shift and there's going to be a scaling factor this scaling factor is due to the channel and we are summing from n equal to 1 capital n what's capital n it's the number of multipath components a noise will be added at the receiver so the received signal is sum of different multipath components and we'd like to model this if we have narrow band fading models if we assume we have narrow band then it means that almost all the signals will be received at the same time so we don't have to worry about tau so this equation is going to be simplified if you notice here that I'm dropping the term tau and um, things remain the same because tau is now is not function of n uh, and it's going to be outside so this is simplified version and this is under the assumption of narrow band model if you take this green part and call it this is the impact of multipath some of different multipath components having different uh, amplitudes and different phases the combination of these will give you beta narrow band remember that some of different cosines will give you a single cosine and that is going to be uh, having a certain amplitude and phase so let's call this beta t that's that would represent the multipath uh, components in fact it, it, it represents everything shadowing scaling and so on so to model beta we can think of the following uh, linear model and this is the equivalent base band so I'm not going to show you the multiplication by the carrier I'll take a signal u of t with a certain power p of t as it travels it's going to be scaled by a constant uh, by amplitude by which represent by a factor which represents the path loss and then a factor that represents scaling multiplication because we are dealing with with linear in db it will be subtraction but here we have a shadowing and then again we have a factor which we are just including which is fading and then we have the equivalent low bass um, the baseband equivalent noise so n is the noise that's added and w or omega is, is uh, w is, is the equivalent uh, low ba uh, baseband noise all right uh, then we need to know what is this beta and what is the distribution of this beta uh, since this includes everything we're going to take the mean power to be determined by path loss and shadowing and we have seen what the path loss the expected value of uh, the power of, of this factor would be given by the following distribution by the following relation we had this before that's without multipath fading and we know what psi is it follows a normal distribution now we need to add something which is the impact of uh, the impact of uh, multipath fading so the mean will come from shadowing and path loss the distribution itself how this factor the fading factor changes is going to be following Rayleigh or Rice distribution or other distributions like Nakagami we'll, we'll discuss them in details and also the autocorrelation function the autocorrelation function will explain the difference uh, how these samples are related how quickly things change so we will be using JX model which tells how quickly things would change remember that we have the PDF but if we want to know the time relation we need to have the autocorrelation function also more about this will be said later in the coming slides the uniform assumption the uniform scattering assumption yes this is needed uh, this is this assumption is needed when we uh, continue with driving our model for the for narrow band or wide band uh, fading models multipath fading models the meaning of uniform scattering is that we will assume that the scatterers where we have capital N of them here are uniformly distributed around the transmitter okay uh, they're coming from all direction with the transmitter receiver uniform as scattering assumption means that we don't know the direction so it would be fair to assume that they are uniformly distributed the power of each one of them would be the expected value of alpha squared which is 2 pr divided by n where n is the number of scatterers and pr is the total received power 
Remember that in the baseband model, there could be a factor of two in the power because once we modulate, the, the power will be reduced to half of its original baseband uh, quantity. So maybe as an exercise, you can try to sum over n and see how much you get in terms of power. So now we need to know what is the distribution model for the multipath fading. The first one, number one, is Rayleigh fading. Rayleigh fading is based on the assumption of, of uh, uniform scattering. And for large number of n using central limit theorem, you know that things will add up into Gaussian. So unless there is a dominant path, if we have just scatterers, then we, we will find out that the real part and the imaginary part of the scatterers of the multipath scaling is going to follow Gaussian or normal distribution. The real part, this is the real part, and this is the imaginary part. And if the real part and the imaginary part, they both follow uh, normal distribution, we can say that beta is going to follow complex Gaussian. And the variance of uh, is due to the shadowing plus path loss the variance will be will come from the shadowing and the path loss. And if we are interested in the magnitude, we are saying here that the real part and the major part are going to follow normal. So beta itself, in terms of magnitude, will be Rayleigh fading. So if we have a complex number where the real part is Gaussian and the imaginary part is Gaussian, that's the number is complex Gaussian, and we are interested in the amplitude itself, then or the magnitude of of of, uh, of the distribution then we get Rayleigh distributed. So this is kind of variable transformation. What's Rayleigh distributed? What I'm sharing with you here below is the expressions. So here is how the Rayleigh fading PDF look like. And here is the CDF. So this is the PDF and here we have the CDF. In terms of mathematical expression, we are given the PDF for, for the Rayleigh as function of X. Here is X and that will give you the PDF. So X is the variable here. And then it's going to be x over sigma squared minus x squared over 2 sigma squared. And the PDF will be the integral of that. You can do the integration, and which we have done, and it turns out to be 1 minus exponential. Of course, there is no way that you get negative, okay, because we are getting into the impact of scaling of power. So there is 0 for, for less than 0. Uh, if you have a little bit of probability and you can find the expected value of the PDF and it's going to be square root of pi over 2 sigma, expected value of z squared is going to be 2 sigma squared and the variance, we can find the variance from these two moments, is going to be 2 minus pi over 2 sigma squared. The median is 1.177 sigma. All of these can be derived from the PDF. I'm just sharing it with you because the Rayleigh distribution is very, very well known. For, for wireless communication. Remember, it comes as a result of uncorrelated scattering, uniform scattering, and these are distributed uniformly everywhere without any dominant path. So we, we don't have line of sight, it's just no dominant path. We are here not after memorizing the expression, but we need to know where and how we got to this PDF, the Rayleigh distribution. So Gaussian channel coefficients is the start, the envelope is going to be Rayleigh, and the power itself, if the amplitude is Rayleigh, if you use, again, random variable transformation, and you're interested in the square of this. So transforming Rayleigh, uh, or finding the variable squared, will result into exponential power. So let's get it straight. The coefficients are complex Gaussian uh, coefficients. The envelope, the amplitude is Rayleigh, and the power is exponential. Now, for this model, we'll take the following example. Given that alpha or gamma, sorry, equal to 3.71, denote is 1, 1 meter, k is minus 31.5 dB, the transmitted power is 1 milliwatt, should shadowing variance is given to be 13.3 dB. So the required question task, assuming Rayleigh fading, how would you generate coefficients for d equal to 1.5 meters and d equal to 300 meters. That's, I want some generated random uh, received power for the following cases. We'll start with uh, the case of 150 meters. The transmitted power is 1 milliwatt, which translates into, if you take 10 log base 10 of this, it becomes 0 dBm. 
dBm because we are having relative to milliwatt. So we have zero dB transmitted power. The path loss, okay, if you follow the equation for the path loss, so we have the K minus 31.5, and then we follow the impact of distance because this, this loss is at distance equal to zero. But for other distances, we have the following minus 112.233 dB. So we have the transmitted power, and we now have the path loss. So what is the shadowing effect? For shadowing, to show the shadowing, if I'm going to generate a Gauss uh, in dB, of course, it's going to be log normal distributed. So I will get, if I'm using that MATLAB, for example, I will generate a rand n, random number, okay, and I'm going to multiply by square root of the variance of the shadowing. And uh, you multiply by the square root of the variance, which is a standard deviation. Let's say that the result of this, let's call it shadowing effect, SH. Then next, what we're going to do, we have transmitted power, we have the impact of path loss, and we have the impact of shadowing. What remains is the impact of the multipath fading. Again, we mentioned that multipath fading, we're going to follow Rayleigh distributed for the amplitude. And of course, for, for the power, it's going to be exponential. So this is the complex exponential which is really fading for, for, the, for the envelope. And we call it really fading channel. So the channel itself is, called, is going to be called really. So uh, if you want to get the fading, then you get to get an exponential decay factor. So to continue with the example, of course, if we go to different distance, here will be the same for, for distance of 300, things will be repeated. So now let's look at how to generate loss, path loss, shadowing really using MATLAB. I'm going to summarize, decide on the power, uh, on the parameter and and P transmitted, the transmitted power. Generate the path loss using the path loss exponent model. And of course, uh, we have uh, to scale the transmitted power. If you're going to use a linear scale, you multiply. Okay, to get the, the shadowing, you need to get, uh, of course, uh, Gaussian and the log normal scale. So generating the, the Gaussian or the normal here in the dB scale, I'm going to use the variance. The result, if you want to multiply, you should go from dB to normal scale. How do you do that? You divide by 10 and you take 10 raised to power. So this is the inverse of finding the dB. So going back to the linear scale, and this is why you are multiplying. Now, to, if you want to generate the multipath effect, let's call it multipath uh, fading uh, profile. So we have the MPFP or multi-path fading parameter, then it's going to be an exponential because we are looking at power. We remember we said if, if the channel is really fading, then the power will be exponential. So get an exponential okay, number, and you're going just to be scared because we, we already accounted for the parameters in the, in the, in the generation of the, of the shadowing. So, uh, the received signal will be the transmitted power times the path loss times the shadowing effect times the scaling as a result of multipath. Another way is just you can, instead of generating exponential, you can generate the amplitudes, find the channel coefficients, and then multiply by the gain, and finally find the power. The code on the right hand, in the, in the, right, uh, the right hand side, this is the MATLAB code that you need to, to implement. I started with the code from Professor Hank, uh, and then there are, might there might be some little modifications. But the original code come from Professor Hank. So, uh, if you want to generate the parameters, then of course you need to generate complex numbers with uh, the proper variance. Okay, the result of this code, you can see that um, we are assuming fast fading, and then this is uh, the received constant, let's say the received path loss or expected received signal, and here is the variations as a result of multipath around this value. So what you see in blue is the, is, is the variation due to shadowing and multipath, due to shadowing and multipath, because the deterministic value is the path loss with the transmitted power, and then these variations come from shadowing and multipath. I will be sharing the code with you, so you can, you can find some, the code, uh, and uh, please do try to implement the code. The code will be shared either in the course website or in the comment section. The second model is the model number two, the Ryssian fading. 
it is very similar to the, the derivation that we have for the case of uh, Rayleigh but here we assume that there is a direct line of sight so there is a line of sight that's always there and then we have scatters so there is one dominant path and then we have other multipath effect okay so this distribution is going to be called Ryssian distribution so beta is made of one dominant component and this is like the really kiss all right so uh, if you ask for the case of the line of sight its power is going to be a squared while for the case of the other multipath components is going to be sig two sigma squared so the result will be s squared which is this is called the k factor Ricean factor is, is a measure of how much is the line of sight compared with the with the power and in, in the in, in the multipath components so you want this number to be large so that you get a strong line of sight component this is called the k factor the Ricean distribution look like the following so I'm, I'm sharing with you the mathematical expression so we have the Bissell function and uh, the total power the power of the scatterers and the line of sight power so if you want to compare uh, this is exactly what we said here uh, the Ricean factor is the squared over 2 sigma squared and of course then we have uh, 0 the, the Ricean factor is going to be 0 if there are no line of sight and it would be infinity if there is no fading no scatters so usually the number is, is going to be in between this is the case of k0 this is the Rayleigh distribution as we start increasing k then the distribution shape started uh, to change uh, dramatically until we get larger values so for the case of k equal to 10 k equal to 3 and then k equal to 0 okay so this is for the case of total power of 5 the plot is generated for the case of total power equal to 5 Uh, the total power of course would be the result of path loss and shadowing okay that's the value and then of course we have variations due to uh, multipath fading so the total power is the result of the transmitted power multipath uh, path loss and shadowing and then the variation will result from the multipath when it comes to the MATLAB generation of the Ricean fading the following plot shows you three different cases with k equal to 0, 5, 500 and what we are showing here is the received power so if you want to see how things work then we generate um, we're going to make 20,000 cases realizations we will fix the average power and we'll fix the k factor of course we can have a 2, 5 here 0, 5 or 500 and then we of course can find the variance the power of the received signal the power of the line of sight so we look we generate line of sight channel and line, line of sight channels of course and uh, we're going to repeat this many times and find the received power when finally we will, will plot the histogram and get the mean of this histogram so this is more of uh, the code will be shared with you you can you can enjoy uh, playing with it the code is originally from professor Hank and there might be some minor modifications summary of signal envelope detection uh, we are using the central limit theorem approximation which leads to Rayleigh distribution the power is going to be exponential when line of sight component present is present then we have Ricean distribution okay uh, or Ricean distribution is used we measure other we, we talked about Rayleigh and, uh, and Ricean but we know for fact the, the Ricean by the way is shown here at the top we know for a fact that um, measurements support Nakagami so those two models are not enough to fit with the measurement so we use Nakagami which is similar to Ricean but model worse uh, than, than Rayleigh uh, lends itself better to close form bit error rate expressions so why people are using Nakagami because of these two things similar to Ricean but models worse than Rayleigh cases and also it lends itself better to to mathematical expressions for the probability of error rate because at the end of the day we are doing all of this to find how would this affect the how would this affect the probability of error and different cases for 
M is shown here. It's time to practice. A multipath fading channel has a multipath spread, delay spread of two seconds, Tm equal to two seconds, and a doubler spread of 0.04 Hz. The total channel bandwidth at a band bus at band bus available for the for the transmission of the signal is doubly equal to 5 Hz. To reduce the effect of intersymbol interference, the signal designer selects a duration of t equal to 20 seconds. So the first thing is required: determine the coherence bandwidth and the coherence time of the channel. Number two: Is the channel frequency selective? or not? Is it frequency selective or flat fading channel? Third question is, is this channel fading slowly or rapidly? I'd like to see your answers in the comment section. Indicate your answers to A, B, and C. Thank you again, and we'll cross-check our answers in the comment section. Thank you, and see you in next video.